Why should I love this gentleman? At his odds, he never will affect me. I am base. My father, the mean keeper of his prison, and he, a prince. To marry him is hopeless. To be as whore as witless. Out upon it! Of what pushes are we wenches driven to when fifteen once has found us? First, I saw him. I, seeing, thought he was a goodly man. He has as much to please a woman in him, should he please to bestow it so, as ever these eyes yet looked on. Next, I pitied him. And so would any young wench or my conscience that ever dreamed or vowed her maidenhead to a young, handsome man. And then I loved him, extremely loved him, infinitely loved him. And yet, he had a cousin, fair as he too. But in my heart was Palamon, and there, oh Lord, what a coil he keeps to hear him sing in an evening what a heaven it is. And yet his songs are sad ones. Fairer spoken was never gentleman. When I come in to bring him water in a morning, first he bows his noble body, then salutes me thus. <clears throat> Fair gentle maid, good morrow. May thy goodness get thee a happy husband. Once he kissed me. I loved my lips the bridge of ten days after. Why do we do so every day? He grieves much, and me as much to see his misery. What should I do to make him know I love him? For I would fain enjoy him. Say, say I ventured to set him free. What says the law then? So much for lore, kindred. I will do it. And this night, or tomorrow, he shall love me. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dank morning? What is Brutus sick, and will he steal from his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night, and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus, you have some sick offence within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And so on my knees I charm you, by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love and that one great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me, yourself, your half, why you are heavy. And what men tonight have had to resort to you? For here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted that I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself but in sort or limitation to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it is so, Portia is Brutus' harlot, not his wife. I have no tongue but one. Gentle, my lord, let me entreat you speak the former language, and I will proclaim thee, Angelo. Look for it. Sign me a present pardon for my brother, or with an outstretched throat I will tell the world aloud what man thou art. Whom should I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? O oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self-same tongue, either of condemnation or of proof. 
bidding the law to make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. I'll to my brother, yet hath he fallen by prompture of the blood, though hath the e in him such a mind of honour, that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'll yield them up. Before his sister should her body stoop to such abhorred pollution, then Isabel, live chaste, and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request, and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. This mill planet reigns. I must be patient until the heavens look with an aspect more favourable. Good, my lords, I am not prone to weeping as our sex commonly are, the want of which vain you perchance shall dry your pities. But I have that honourable grief lodged here which burns worse than tears drown. Beseech you all, my lords, as qualified as your charity shall best instruct you. Measure me, and the king's will be performed. Who is that goes with me? Beseech your highness. My women may be with me, for you see my plight requires it. Do not weep, good fools, for there is no cause. When you shall know your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in tears as I come out. This action I now go on is for my better grace. Adieu, my lord. I never wish to see you sorry. Now I trust I shall. My women come. You have leave. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it, yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul. My soul, the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts that people this little world in humours like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples, and you set the faith itself against the faith. As thus, come, little ones. And again, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a needle's eye Thoughts tending to ambition do plot unlikely wonders that these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune slaves, nor shall not be the last, like silly beggars who, sitting in the stocks, refuse their shame, that many have and others must sit there, and in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the backs of those that have before endured the like. Thus play I in one person, many people, and none contented. First am I a king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Thus am I kinged again, and by and by I think that I am unkinged by Bolingbroke, 
and straight and nothing but whatever I am. Nor I, nor any man that but man is, with nothing, shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. The time was, Father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now, when your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry through many a north would look to see his father bring up powers, but he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honours lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven brighten it, but for his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the grey vault of heaven, and by his light did all the shivery of England move to do brave acts. He was the mark wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait, and speaking thick, which nature did his blemish, become the accents of the valiant. He was the mark and glass the copy and book that fashioned others and him. O oh, wondrous him, O oh, miracle of men, did you, second to none, unseconded by you, left him to face the hideous god of war in disadvantage. So you left him. Never, O oh, never, do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him. Let him alone. My liege, I did deny no prisoners, but I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom and his chin new reaped, showed like a stubble land at harvest home, he was perfumed, like a melaner, and twixt his finger and his thumb, he held a pouncer box, which ever and none, he gave his nose and took it away again. Who there was angry when it next came there, took it in snuff. And still, he smiled and talked, and as his soldiers, bore dead bodies by. He called the Montauk knaves, unmannerly, to bring a slovenly on a handsome course betwixt the wind and his nobility. With many holiday and lady terms, he questioned me amongst the rest, demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting with my wounds being cold, to be so pestered with a popinjay, out of my grief and my impatience, answered neglectingly. I know not what he should or he should not, for he made me mad. To see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds. God save the mark. Was the hope drunk in which you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou a feared to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteems the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would like the poor cat in the adage? When you durst do it, then you are a man, 
and to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness does now unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, had plucked my nipple from its boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. Why, then, tomorrow night, or Tuesday morn, on Tuesday noon or night, on Wednesday morn, I prithee, Name the time, but let it not exceed three days. In faith, he is penitent, and yet his trespass in our common reason. Save that, they say, the wars must make examples out of their best. It's not almost a fault to incur private check. When will he come? Tell me, a fellow, I wonder in my soul what you would ask me, that I should deny or stand so mowing on. What? Michael Cassio that came a wooing with you in so many a time. When I've spoken of you dispraisingly, have taken your part to have so much to do to bring him in. Why, this is not a boon. Tis as I should entreat you. You wear your gloves, or feed you on nourishing dishes, or keep you warm, or sue you to your own peculiar profit, to your own person. Nay. When I have a suit wherein I mean to touch your love, indeed, it shall be full of poise and difficult weight and fearful to be granted. Not only, sir, this, your all licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue, do hourly carp and quarrel breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress, but now go fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done, that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance, which if you should, the fault would not scape censure nor the redress sleep, which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their working do you that offence which else were shame that then necessity must call discreet proceeding. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright. Here do you hold a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this our court infected with their manners shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and a lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself doth speak for instant remedy. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs a little disquantity to your train. And the remainder that may still be such men as may besought your age, which know themselves and you. Thus stands it with me. Upon a true contract, I got possession of Julietta's bed. You know the lady. She is fast my wife, save that we do the denunciation lack of outward order. This we came not to, only for propagation of a dower, remaining in the coffer of her friends, from whom we thought it meet to hide our love, till time had made them for us but it chances the stealth of our most mutual entertainment with character too gross is writ on Juliet. And the new deputy now for the Duke, whether it be the fault and glimpse of newness or whether that the body public be a horse whereon the governor doth ride, who newly in the seat, that it may know he can command, lets it straight fill the spur. 
whether the tyranny be in his place or in his eminence that fills it up, I stagger in. But this new deputy awakes me all the enrolled penalties which have, like unscoured armour, hung by the wall so long that 19 zodiacs have gone round and none of them been worn. And for a name, now puts the drowsy and neglected act freshly on me. Tis surely for a name. <laughs> oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She's the fairy's midwife, and she comes in a shape no bigger than an agate stone. On the forefinger of an older man, drawn with a little team of atomies, a woman's noses they lie asleep. Her wagon spokes are made of long spider's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, her whip of cricket's bone, the lash of film. Her wagoner, a small grey-coated gnat, not so big as a round little worm, pricked from the lazy finger of a mate. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut made by the joiner squirrel or old grub. Time out of the mind, fairies, coachmakers, and in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains and then they dream of love. Sometime she gallops over Cortis's nose and then he dreams of smelling out a suit. Sometime she driveth over soldiers' neck, and then he dreams of cutting foreign throats, of breeches, ambuscos, then anon. Drums in his ear at which he starts and wakes, and being thus frighted, swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. This is that very map that plats the manes of horses in the night, that bakes elf folks in such foul, sluttish hairs, which once untangled much misfortune boats. When maids lie on their backs, that presses them and learns them first to bear, making them women of good carriage. This is she. Hard to seem one, but I was one, my lord, with the first glance that ever... Pardon me, if I confess much, you'll play the tyrant. I love you now, but not till now so much, but I might master it. In faith I lie, my thoughts were like unbridled children grown too headstrong for their mother. See, we fools, why have I blabbed? <laughs> Who shall be true to us when we are so unsecret to ourselves? But though I loved you well, I wooed you not, and yet, good faith, I wished myself a man, or that we women had men's privilege of speaking first. Sweet. Bid me hold my tongue, for in this rapture I shall surely speak the thing I shall repent. See, see, your silence, cunning in dumbness, from my weakness draws my very soul of counsel. Stop my mouth. I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humour of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun that doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he wish again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by, by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapours that did seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. Yet when they seldom come, they wish for gum, and nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So when this loose behaviour I throw off, and pay the debt I never promised, by how much more than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes. And like a bright metal, on sullen ground, my reformation, glittering on oh, my fault, shall show more goodly, and attract more eyes, than that which hath no foil to set it off. Also offend, to make offence a skill, redeeming time when men think least I will. I will not be thy executioner, I fly thee, for I will not injure thee. 
Thou tell'st me there is murder in mine eyes. Tis pretty, sure, and very probable. That eyes that are the foulest and softest things who shut their coward gates on atomies should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. And now I do frown on thee of all my heart. And if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. Now counterfeit to swoon. Why now fall down? Or if thou cannot, for shame, for shame, lie not. To say mine eyes are murderers. Now shame me the wound my eye hath made on thee. Scratch thee but with a pin. And there remains a scar of it. Lean but upon a rush. The cicatrice and capable in pressures. Thy palms some moments keep. But in mine eyes, which I dart at thee, hurt thee not. Nor, I am sure, there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. <laughs> Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy, yet he talks well. But what care I for words, yet words do well. When he that speaks and pleases those that hear, it is a pretty youth. Not very pretty, but sure he's proud and yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion. And faster than his tongue did make offence. His eye did heal it up. He's not very tall. And yet for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so. And yet tis well. There was a pretty redness in his lip. A little riper, more lusty, red than that mixed in his cheek. It was just the difference. Betwixt the constant red and mingled damask, <laughs> there be some women, Sylvius. Had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. And yet have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he to do to chide at me? He said mine eyes were black and my hair black, and now I am remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. Amicence is no quittance. I'll write to him. A very taunting letter. And thou shalt bear it. What thou, Sylvius? Are not you moved? When all the sway of the earth shakes like a thing unfirm. O oh, Cicero, I have seen tempests. Like the scolding winds have rived the knotty oaks. I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam be exalted with the threatening clouds, but never till tonight, never till now did I go through a tempest dropping fire, either there is a civil strife in heaven, or the world too saucy for the gods incenses them to send destruction. A common slave, you know him well by sight, held up his left hand which did burn and flame like twenty torches, but yet his hand not sensible of fire remained unscorched. Besides, I have not since held up my sword to the capital. I met a lion who glared upon me and went surely by without annoying me. And there, a heap of ghastly women, transformed by their fear, who swore they saw men all in fire walk up and down the streets. And the bird of night did sit, even at noonday upon the marketplace, hooting and shrieking. When these prodigies do so conjointly meet, let not men say, these are their reasons. They are natural. For I believe these are pretentious things, and to the climate that they point upon.
the mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy. For your own reasons, turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters worrying you. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. My Lord of Cambridge here, you know how apt our love was to accord to furnish him with all appurtenance belonging to his honour. And this man hath, for a few light crowns, lightly conspired, and sworn unto the practices of France to kill us here in Hampton. To the which, this knight no less for bounty bound to us than Cambridge's hath likewise sworn. But, oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Scroope, thou cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature, thou that didst bear the key of all my counsels, that knewest the very bottom of my soul, that almost might have coined me into gold, wouldst thou have practised on me for thy use? May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger? is so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. Oh, how hast thou with jealousy infected the sweetness of affiance? Show men, dutiful, why so didst thou. Seem they grave and learned, why so didst thou. Come they of noble family, why so didst thou? Seem they religious, why so didst thou? Or are they spare in diet, free from gross passion or of mirth or anger, constant in spirit, not swerving with the blood, Garnished and decked in modest compliment, not working with the eye without the ear, and but in purge judgment, trusting neither. Such and so finely bolted didst thou seem, and thus thy fall hath left a kind of blot to mark the full fraught man and best endued with some suspicion. <laughs> I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fall of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the answer of the law. Now might I do it, Pat? Now he is praying. And now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven and so Am I revenged? That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same vision sent to heaven? Why, this is hire and salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes bread blown as flush as may. But how is all it stands? Who knows, save heaven, but 
in our circumstance and course of thought. It is heavy with him. And so am I revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for passage? No, up sword, and know thou a more horrid hent than when he is drunk asleep or in his rage or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about an act that has no relish of salvation in it. <laughs> then trip him. May his heels kick at heaven, and may his soul be as damned and black as hell. Where to it goes? My mother stays. This prayer but prolongs thy sickly days. You've ungently Brutus stole from my bed. And yesternight at supper, you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, then you scratched your head and too impatiently stamped your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you'd answer not but with an angry wafter of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience, which seemed too much enkindled, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humour, which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, and could it work so much upon your shape, as it hath much prevailed on your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my Lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. The clock struck nine when I did send the nurse. In half an hour she promised to return. Perchance, she cannot meet him. That's not so. Oh, she is lame. Love's heralds should be thoughts which ten times faster glide than the sun's beams, driving back shadows over lowering hills. Therefore do nimble pinion doves draw love, and therefore hath the wind swift cupid wings. Now the sun is upon the highmost hill of this day's journey, and from nine till twelve is three long hours, yet she has not come. Had she affections and warm, youthful blood, she would be as swift in motion as a ball. My words would bandy her to my sweet love and his to me. But old folks, many fain as they were dead, unwieldy, slow, heavy, and pale as lead. Oh God, she comes. Is there no way for men to be? But women must be half workers. We are all bastards. All. And that most venerable man, which I did call my father, was I know not where when I was stamped some coiner with his, his tools, made me a counterfeit. Yet my mother seemed the dying of that time. So doth my wife. So non pare of this. Oh, vengeance! Vengeance! Me of my lawful pleasure, she restrained and prayed me off forbearance. 
did it with a pudency so rosy, the sweet viewant might well have warmed old Saturn. But I thought her as chaste as unsunned snow. Oh, all the devils. This yellow Iacmu in an hour was not, or lest at first perchance he spoke not, but like a full acorn boar, a German one, cried O oh, and mounted, found no opposition but what he looked for should oppose and she should from encounter guard. Could I find out the woman's part in me? For there's no motion that tends to vice in man. But I affirm it is the woman's part. Be it lying. Note it. The woman's flattering hers. Deceiving hers. Lust and rank thoughts hers. Hers, ambitions, covetings, change of prides, disdain, nice longing, slanders, mutability. All faults that man may name, nay, that hell knows why hers in part, or all, but rather all. For even to vice they are not constant. One vice, but of a minute old for one, not half so old as that. I'll write against them, detest them, curse them. Yet, tis greater skill in a true hate to pray they have their will. The very devils cannot plague them better. What? Do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not, for you are mortal. And mortal eyes cannot endure the devil. I'll vaunt thy dreadful minister of hell. Thou hast no power over his mortal body and his soul thou canst not have. Therefore be gone. Foul devil, for God's sake, hence untrouble us not. For thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, and for the cursing cries and deep exclaims, if thou wouldst like to view thy heinous deeds. O oh, gentlemen, see, see dead Henry's wounds. Open the congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Oh, blush, blush the lump of thy deformity, for tis thy presence excels his blood from his cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. Thy deed is inhumane and unnatural, it provokes the deluge most unnatural. O oh, God, which has blood me, to revenge his death. O oh, earth which is blood drink is revenge his death. I will heaven and lightning strike this murderer dead. O oh, earth gate wide open and swallow him quick. As doth did swallow this good king's blood, which is how governed arm half butchered. Sir, spare your threats. The bug which you would fright me with I seek. To me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favour I do give lost, for I do feel it gone, but know not how it went. My second joy and first fruits of my body, from his presence I am barred, like one infectious. My third comfort starred most unluckily. It's from my breast the most innocent milk in its most innocent mouth, held out to murder. 
Myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet. With immodest hatred, the childbed privilege denied, which longs to women of all fashion. Lastly, hurried here to this place, in the open air, before I have strength of limit. Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore proceed. But yet hear this, no life I prize it not a straw, but for my honour, which I would free. If I shall be condemned upon surmises, all proofs sleeping else, but what your jealousies awake, I tell you it is rigour and not law. Your honours all. I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo, be my judge. I see a man's life is a tedious one. I have tired myself for two nights together, have made the ground my bed. I should be sick, but that my resolution helps me. Milford, when from the mountain top Pisanio showed thee, thou wast within a ken. Oh, Jove, I think foundations fly the wretched, such I mean where they should be relieved. Two beggars told me I could not miss my way. Will poor folks lie? that have afflictions on them, and knowing tis a punishment or trial. Yes, no wonder, when rich ones scarce tell true, to lapse in fullness is sorer to life need, and falsehood is worse in kings than beggars. My dear Lord, thou art ones, oh the false ones! Now I think on thee, my hunger's gone, but even before I was at point to sink for food, But what is this? Here's a path to it, tis some savage hold. I were best not to call, I dare not call. Yet famine, ere clean it o'erthrow nature, makes it valiant, plenty and peace breeds cowards, hardness ever is hardness mother. Ho, who's there? If anything that civil speak, if savage take or lend. Ho? No answer? Then I'll enter. Best draw my sword, and if mine enemy but fear the sword like me, he'll scarcely look on it. Such a foe, good heavens. But I do think it is their husbands' faults if wives do fall. Say they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps, or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraints upon us. Or say they strike us, scant our former havings in despite. Why, we have girls, and though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. Let husbands know their wives have scents like them. They see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as men have. What is it they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is, and doth affection breed it? I think it doth. It's frailty that thus airs, it is so too. And have we not affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then I say, let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do. Their ills instruct us so.